Hello and welcome to another episode of the All About Valley podcast. This podcast is sponsored by KO Financial, specialists in mortgages and protecting your family's finances. Whether you're looking for the best mortgage for you or want to make sure you and your family aren't struggling if you are seriously ill or pass away, call KO Financial on 0141 447 0290 or email advice at Financial. .co.uk for more information. Today we are joined by Dan Haycock. Dan is a professional wheelchair basketball player and ex paralympian He also focuses on nutrition and coaching online and does a lot of great work with that. It's been an incredible journey and I found it a really enjoyable chat listening to him going through what he's trying to do very motivational guy, very interesting guy. And he, you know, was saying a lot of things that I think will help people, will help a lot of people. Through this time that we, you know, there's a lot of unanswered questions and a lot of uncertainty. And he was definitely somebody that made me go, he really lets a fire inside you. So I hope you all get that same feeling I got from him and enjoy this podcast. Yeah, it's great to finally be recording with you, Dan. Uh, We've been trying to get this arranged for a while, that's uh, we're recording now, so just so you know. Um but yeah, it's good to finally have you on. Uh, I've been looking forward to this. But as I say, a guy with a sort of Scottish accent and cerebral palsy talk to an Englishman doesn't usually mess very well. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> so I was doing a lot of research on you and I, I find it really interesting about how your kind of whole condition came about in terms of you were in an accident at five years old, is that correct? That's right, yeah. I had a little mini motocross bike, um, age five, me and my cousin. Um, he was able to ride said motorbike without stabilizers much quicker than I. Um, and yeah, one one winter morning, not long after Christmas, because we got the bikes for Christmas, um, we you know, was that basically had all the gear, no idea type scenario, balaclava, goggles, helmet, leathers. Um, and I managed to, to do a lap of the field with, with no stabilizers. Um, so my uncle, who was taking us out on that, on that particular day, um, asked me to do another lap um, with the incentive of coming back out on the bikes again the next day. Um, uh, so I went round, opened the throttle up a little bit more than I maybe should have, I guess and managed to fucking locate out of a big massive field a rugby post don't know how it's like I, if, if i'm out in the street i can guarantee you i managed to locate a piece of dog shit on the floor when i'm walking like it's like i, I managed to locate the things that i don't want to be going there and on that particular day when i was five i i seemed to crash into a rugby post <laughs> um and yeah it left me hospitalized for seven months and in a full body plastic cast for a further six months at home and um I got told I would never walk again and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, that that's essentially how I um got my disability. It's amazing to think you were told you would never walk again and then look at what you're doing now. How much of a worry was that at the time? Well, do you know what, mate? I, I, I actually can't remember. I mean all, all I knew was I was in this fucking wheelchair. Um and and a, a lot of the my history I'm is what I've been told from my mum so going through primary school I was in the wheelchair and you know what it's like a you know I, I was the sort of odd one out especially when you're thinking back I was probably six seven seven eight years old sorry so that was like 30 years ago 31 years ago um so there weren't many children going into mainstream schools at that point in in wheelchairs. So um, I was like the, the different kid. Uh, got subject. I was bullied terribly in in primary school, uh, physically, verbally. Um, it got to a point where I wouldn't go outside. I used to stay in school the whole day. Um, at various points of my school life, I got pushed to the top of the football field, tipped out of the wheelchair, and the kids would run off with the wheelchair. And I literally had to crawl back down the football field to to get you know back to, to to my wheelchair going into high school i i decided i wanted to walk again and and, and at that moment i couldn't even really stand up um without holding on to something because I, I you know bear in mind at this point i still had one leg that was functioning well yeah um 
and I, I guess I, my my reasoning for wanting to walk was not to actually walk it was I guess to and this is me thinking back now of why I did what I did I guess it was I wanted to fit in I wanted to stop all the shit that was going on but I thought by walking and getting myself the same as the other kids then that would stop and um, so how the process of me getting myself walking again was I mean it's funny because I always had an obsession of how the human body works and I guess that's why I'm doing what I do as a as, as a job now um, so it started off uh, me just lifting myself up off the chair that I was in at home and like hoisting myself around it whilst holding on you know like hopping with one leg dragging the other leg and you know I would try and do a lap of the chair and then that developed into two laps to three laps and um my mum caught me a couple of times and she absolutely went ballistic because she thought I was going to do myself more damage um anyway that that progressed later down the line into me um stopping behind after school obviously telling my mum I was doing some kind of after school activity um but really I was going into the little multi gym getting on the exercise bike and just moving my leg around um and you know in a relatively short amount of time my leg was getting stronger I was being able to put a little bit more weight through it and started taking steps and 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 that's just developed and and you know what I'm 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 39 next Saturday and it just keeps getting stronger and stronger it's like it's it's pretty fucking crazy I mean don't get me wrong I still get a hell of a lot of pain out of it at certain times and I'm I'm still very limited in in, in terms of what I can do but the, the the difference is is sort of incredible and it just goes to show you that um you know nothing's well there's a lot of things that aren't impossible if you you know if you if you have the patience and the the mindset to 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 go ahead and try and get something done and the human body is a fucking amazing thing and it's all controlled by what goes on up here i couldn't agree more and i really relate to what you were saying about your experience in high school and and just being in a wheelchair because that's like, Almost exactly the same as me. Um, but it made me want to ask you, what, what do you think can be done to like normalise? Because you were talking about how you wanted to fit in and 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 be you know normal and be one of the one of the boys, so to speak. So, what what do you think can be done to help normalise disability in these kind of social environments? Well, I mean, what you. What you've got to consider, I mean, you, you went out to signal a little bit then, but I've got the gist of what you're asking. What you have to consider is this. It's not just a case of, um, what you've got to remember is children can be very, very nasty. And, it, it uh, you know, it's bullying at school and, and things being socially acceptable at school has always been around since the day dot. And I, I guess to a certain extent, it always will be around. And, and things like, you know, if, if you wear glasses, you get bullied. If you're fat, you get bullied. If you've got a different colour skin, you get bullied. Uh, you're different in some way, shape or form. And I guess the only way to combat this is to just raise awareness. I mean, for, for example, when... You know, going back 40 years, if you were in a wheelchair, the, the, the fact would probably be your family would keep you in the back room and not introduce you to anybody. At all. There was a point in time when that was very, very normal to happen. Yeah. And now you have wheel, wheelchair bound athletes that are elite athletes. Absolutely. Like, they train fucking five, six hours a day in tremendous shape physically and mentally. And um, the only thing different is they have no use of limbs, uh, dependent on what limb uh, through uh, being paralyzed or through loss of limb or whatever and i guess it's just raising awareness that you know we're all the same uh, and but i i you know there there is always going to be a small percentage of the population that are going to think otherwise and that's that's never ever going to change in my opinion never there's always going to be a small amount of the population but the the i i guess the the, the goal is to keep raising that percentage of people that think the way we think about yeah. it yeah and i suppose if you can overcome those kind of things it's a really good character building thing in some ways it's like the experience you spoke about about having to crawl down the field the back of your chair those kind of things you don't really forget no mate I, well do, do you know what it's funny because you you i i do forget and it's only when i talk about it that i remember and think shit like fuck 
have come a bloody long way and and you know a lot, a lot of people don't realize that how far they've come from from where they were and they don't give themselves the credit that they actually deserve um but yeah character building yeah i mean i i, I think life is just one big fucking character building lesson step by step through various mm-hmm. things um but yeah there's a, there's a lot of um you know there's a lot of resilience involved there's a lot of patience involved there's a lot of persistence involved in in in, in things and you know that's like you, like you say it's it's just all character building mm-hmm. i read that you were talking about how uh, you were watching your friends kind of play sports and wanted to get involved and um you kind of discovered play basketball from there well yeah so you know when i mean i i was i was the fat kid as well because basically i would sit because i didn't walk i didn't do any activity all my activity was playing on the computer and eating apple pies and eating <laughs> eating sweets and chocolate and crisps that was my that was my life basically yeah. so obviously at school at high school uh you know see the kids playing football rugby whatever the case may be um i i used to just get put into a classroom you know sit there for, for an hour wait till class passes and then go to the next class I didn't get bored with at all. Then a new PE teacher came to school and he was a, he was a, you know, he's a bit of a basketball fan. And he told me that I could play basketball in a wheelchair. And I was like, I didn't know whether to believe him or not. Anyhow, he put me in contact with the local team. I started to go, um, got told I had potential relatively in a relatively short amount of time. And I absolutely loved it. it, it obviously it was something completely new to me. Uh, made a load of new friends. Uh, look, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm, I'm the, I'm a competitive CU next Tuesday at everything that I do. So I, I, I had that in me from an, an early age and I loved being around different people. I loved being active and um, I, I was literally hooked on wheelchair basketball from like 13 years old when I started, hooked on it. That's amazing. You know, there's something you just touched on there as you were talking that I found really interesting was mentioning how because you're in the wheelchair, uh, it didn't really help your physical condition. You kind of got fired and, and unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, this was something that kind of dawned on me as I started the podcast and realising that it wasn't until I got into the gym and things that really I was able to start to be more able and not feel as disabled, so to speak. Uh, yeah. Do you think that maybe the disabled people are, less, are almost not encouraged enough to, to realise how important it is for us to actually get moving and do these things? Yeah. Well, do you know what? I mean, th- this might trigger a few people, but I-, I have a particular opinion on this. So, let's. I- I'm I'm going to use my mum as an example. So, I-, I have my accidents, wheelchair bound from five years old. Mum becomes very protective, doesn't want me to do anything because she's scared of me hurting myself. Oh no, you can't do this. Oh no, you can't do that. But what if this person does this to you? What? And you become very fucking sheltered and you live in some kind of little bubble and you never get pushed on to, yeah, you can actually go and do something that you want. Yeah, if you, if you want to go and speak in front of 200 people about your experience as being in a wheelchair, you can do it. Not, oh no, what if they laugh at you? Blah, blah, blah. Do you know what I mean? I think I think as if, if you have some kind of physical disability or some kind of mental disability, I think it's and this is nothing on the people that are trying to shelter you i think that it comes from a, a place of love on their half but i don't think it does the actual person any good in the long run because you get used to like you know being in this protective bubble and not actually going out and living your own life and doing the things that you maybe want to do because you, you you're brought up and you have that subconscious thought pattern that um, you're going to get hurt or you might not be able to do this or you, or you might not be able to do that. Well, you know, nobody knows whether they can do something unless they actually go and fucking try it. Yeah. I've never, I've found that very relatable, to be honest. That I very much concur with what Evan you said there because... Absolutely. Uh, you know, my experience was so similar in the sense of, like, you have this shelter and, you, and, you, and your kind of confidence kind of goes down a bit because you're not sure... If you could put yourself out there without getting these things, these negative things, and what one million percent, mate. Uh, you know, I, I've spent, uh, like I say, I'm 39 next Saturday on the 5th of December. If anybody's watching and he wants to send me a present, that's absolutely fine by me. But if I've spent the best part of my life feeling worthless, 
not feeling good enough, um, not feeling like I can do what I want, not having the confidence to go and do it, and all these type of things. And it's only... Obviously, as, as I got into my 20s, I got a little bit more confidence, but I was still deep down. I guess it was more of a front than an actual real confidence. It's only in the last 10 years that that actual real confidence has come out, and that's just due to the pure grit and grind of actually working on myself to bring that out that that's come about but it all boils down to those thought processes and those behaviors and those things that I experienced as a child that were taught to me that were said to me that have stuck with me no you can't go and do this so you if you, if you get told you you can't or you shouldn't go and do something from a very early age even when you become an adult and you know that you actually can go and do it you're still going to have that internal fear that internal uh thing that you pro you know i i might not try this because i probably i'll probably fail at it or I, you know you know all them things stick with you inside yeah um does that make sense yeah definitely and again yeah. you know i'm 24 and i would say that a lot of a lot of things i've inter i had to internalize and i've had that's why i did the podcast now because this is sort of my me kind of overcoming some of those things and, and also yep. trying to make it easier for the next person, hopefully. Um, yeah. I, I think it's a great thing what you're doing, mate, because, you know, if it, if it, if it helps us, I always say if, if it helps just one person, you've done, exactly. a, you've done an amazing job. You've, you've changed a life. Exactly. Yeah. I agree. Uh, that, that's an amazing thing. And then, so we were talking about how you, you in PE and stuff, you were kind of not encouraged to be involved in, I was the same. So, as a person, I really feel something I found really interesting was um, I'm getting almost more disabled to not being able to participate in sports and fitness. Um, I would go to the gym and there would be like a, there would be, I would be, have no real idea of what I could do and what I could do. So, what was that process like for you in terms of figuring out what you could do in a workout sense and building up your body in a way? It was a case of, you know, fucking diving at the deep end and if it's it sink or swim, you either find out whether you can do it or you don't. And it's, uh, I, I think, and this can be trans, this can be translated into any area of your life. You, 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 you know, you all, you, you, you have an opportunity in everything that you do in life to identify uh, things that you like, things that you don't like, things that you can do, things that you can't, things that you good at things that you're not so good at things that make you feel good things that don't make you feel good and i think a lot of people go through life in pretty much like um not identifying these things and even if they do identify them it's like they ignore them so people will carry on doing things that don't make them feel good people will carry on you know um do you get what i'm trying to say it's, it's yeah. a case of suck it and see and that, that's essentially what what I did, um, but you know, you know, there's a majority of people that won't even, you know, take that first step to try. And, and I guess it, a lot of that will boil back down to the the fear thing, of mm -hmm. thinking that they're not going to be able to do it, or being told that they shouldn't do it, or whatever the case may be. You know, I read something recently that said half of the people that do things are the people that just start doing them. You know, yeah. it's, 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 most of it's about actually starting to do it. Um, Podcast is a good example because it was something that I put off for months and I wasn't really sure if I could do it. And as soon as I started doing it, people were like, "This is great!" So I was like, "All right, okay, that's a." Uh, yeah, know. I I I agree, mate. And uh, there's two things I always say: um, starting, you half. If you start, you're half done. Yeah, and and people wait putting off. I, I waited for a couple of years before I started my business because I wanted it to be, you know, quote unquote, perfect. And it's a load of bollocks. You know, done is better than perfect. You can fine tune things along the way, but just just start where you stood right now using the tools you've got. And then, you know, you, you can carve your own path and you can sort of make things better as you go along. Exactly. You learn by doing that. Um Exactly, mate. Exactly. So you go, you get into basketball, and you were talking about how that helped you make new friends in, in a social way and things like that. How important do you think basketball was in terms of growing that confidence that you spoke about? Well, I, well, if you're talking about confidence, 
for me, confidence comes through experience. So, so in terms of basketball, I could be extremely confident because it was something I did every day, something that I knew I was good at, something that I had success with. So confidence came with that experience. But if, if you looked at another area of my life, confidence could be fucking way down because my experience in, in my experience in said situation or said thing wasn't so good. But the more you do or experience that the, the, that thing, the more your confidence would rise. And that, that's how I see confidence. It, confidence comes through through experience. You know, I've never, essentially, yeah. It, it, go on, sorry. No, I was going to say, I've never heard somebody put it like that before. And um, again, it becomes something that I, I really relate to because I play a sport called wheelchair football. And that, yeah. I was really, I, there was a point in my life where I'd be really confident in that, but I would come out of it and I would be very sort of um, in my shell and other things. So it, yeah. it's, you're spot on with that. And it's not really something people talk about enough. How, no, no, not at all. And so you, this kind of help, this is kind of helping you, you're, you're, you're seeing how your confidence can grow and you're playing the sport, but you actually travelled around the world and competed at a very high level. When did you realise you could, you could compete at that higher level in basketball? Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you cut out a little bit then, but yeah, I mean, playing basketball took me all around the world on every continent. I've um, seen some amazing things, experienced some amazing things, uh, played in Paralympics, World Championships, um, lived in Europe for 10 years, made a living out of it. Um, and it's been a it's been a platform then to me to to take on the next step of where I am now with with my with my sort of uh, life fitness nutrition coaching business that I have. It, it gave me a good solid platform to work from. So it, it's you know it, obviously it changed my life, um, and it, and it's given me a, a a great life to be to be honest. So if it was something that I wanted to ask because I was quite curious in terms of going around these different countries. What was it like in terms of the accessibility and the travel uh, try to get around these and, and, and as a wheelchair user? Because I travelled to Portugal on my own for the first time last year and I managed yeah. to do it. I managed to do it okay, but it was a difficult kind of thing. And I, yeah. as you're going through the world, I thought, I wonder how the different countries kind of in terms of how you managed to access your way through everything. Um, well, obviously, yeah, di- different countries are completely different in, in terms of handling. And I guess, um, like the when I was in Spain, there was various parts of Spain that were pretty shit for wheelchair users. Um, the last team I played it for in Spain was Albacete, which um, it, it had a complete city revamp. So people could you could literally get from one side of the city to another in a wheelchair in less than ten minutes. Everywhere was completely accessible. It was absolutely amazing. But other parts of Spain, absolutely dire. And then, you know, you have different countries that obviously deal with things. It's like um, certain countries are further ahead with various things than others. The same, it's the same with medicine, the same with, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's just the same kind of scenario. Yeah, it's very true. So we spoke about, like, your journey to basketball and how that all came about and your feelings with the sport. Yeah. But I... I I'm always wondering because I love, you know, uh, wheelchair football so much. Yeah. It's, it's kind of hard for me to imagine, you know, stopping playing and yeah. uh, hanging out the boots, so to speak. What was that whole process like for you and how did you deal with it? Retiring? Yeah. Um, it, it's um, it's a bit of a weird one because, in all honesty, I... I was thinking about retiring for a couple of years. The thing that stopped me, I, I was, I, as a player, I was improving every year. Um, I still, I still had a lot. I still do have a lot to give to the sport. I, I think, in my opinion, but it was time for me to. I mean, the, the main reason I, I retired was because my daughter, my baby girl, was living in the UK, and I was in the south of France. Um, and I just couldn't bear to be away from her any longer. I was, I, you know, I FaceTime every day, but it's, 
not the same. And and because she was so young, I was I felt like I was missing out on so much. So it was um it was a real, real tough decision for me to make. But it was the best decision. Um and also I mean I, I basically turned up for training in um in Cannes at the team I was playing for. And as I was going into the stadium, I walked down and the president and the coach were, were stood there and I said, Look, can I can I pull you into the office? I need to talk to you. And it was literally as I was walking in, I thought, I'm done. I'm done. I've had enough. I'm gone. Totally wasn't expecting to do it, but it just came into my head. And I thought, right, there's a reason for this. I'm going with my my intuition, going with my gut. And went into the office and literally I, I, I broke down in tears. And I said, look, I'm, I'm, I'm really, really sorry, but I'm, I'm done. I'm finishing playing. And he was like, what, at the end of the season, like, you, are you retired? I was like, no, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not even going to train tonight. I'm done. And he, 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 he pleaded with me to, to reconsider, to think about it, not to rush into it. I said, no, I, you know, you can terminate my contract with immediate effect. I'm, I'm finished. Um, went and addressed the team, uh, all the lads, and that was really hard as well, broke down again. Um, and you know, when I got home, I was like thinking, fuck, what, like, what have I just done? Like, this is, I've been playing this sport for 25 years. It's been a massive part of my life. Um, it was, you know, it, it's part of what puts food on my table as well. Um, but the, the reason was I needed to be back in the UK, closer to my daughter. And also thinking back, <clears throat> I think with, it, I, I think basketball was kind of holding me back a little bit with my other business ventures because it was like a safety net. You know, when, when you know, you know, when you work for yourself and you've got your own business, you're under pressure to, to, to put the work in and to, to make the money. I had a safety net of having a salary every month. So I would work hard for a couple of months, take my foot off the gas and I never really, you know, made progress, but never really, you know, got to where I wanted to be. So I, I, I guess it's had a real good effect on, on, on my other projects. And, and you know what? I can't play basketball forever and, and, and I, I wanted to transition out into something else and, and that's what I've done. You know, and don't get me wrong, I, I do miss it. I miss being around the team environment, you know. It's a real big, and especially when I came back to the UK and got put in lockdown, it's a real big difference from being around a group of lads having banter all day and, and being in the group environment and, and doing something that you love to coming and being stuck in the fucking house and... and having not very much contact with people and it's it it yeah it's been tough it's been tough but it was the absolute right thing to do would i ever go back and play who knows who knows never say never but it would purely be for fun like nothing yeah. nothing yeah. you know that, that you know never say never but i i don't think i will at this moment in time well you've took it in your stride obviously and, and created your own business and, and working with coaching and nutrition now and really dive into that, which I'm enjoying seeing the progress with it. Uh, but falling from that, I have a couple of questions kind of came to mind, which were wheelchair basketball, you get paid, so a lot of players get paid, and it's became this sort of it's the closest thing to like a mainstream sport that we have in disability sport. I think wheelchair basketball, I argue. And I think that quite interesting because, in terms of wheelchair football and botcher and other kind of disability sports like that, you don't really get a uh, Athletes that can make a living from it, really. What do you think the main difference is between what basketball has managed to achieve compared to other disability sports and how they can maybe get up to that level? Right. I, I, I don't I don't see it as a case of it's just in like it in comparison to other disability sports. I mean, what you gotta consider is in the UK, domestic basketball do not pay. Yeah. So there's no salary. You, you might have teams that pay travel expenses or, you know those type of scenarios but what you got to really understand is in Europe which is where people go to get paid basketball is either the number one or number two sport of that country mm -hmm. the basketball is like the able-bodied basketball players get paid millions of euros per year to play it's a real real basketball is a real real big deal so yeah. 
it stands to reason that wheelchair basketball will be kind of a big deal because mm. people just love basketball in general. And when you have so many elite players all playing in various leagues, it makes for very good, it's good uh, entertainment for people to go and watch. So you have, you, you have teams that have big crowds going to watch the games every week. Um, it's like, it's complete other world to what it is in the UK. Like an, it's another level. Uh, and, and I guess that's why it, the, 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 that's the difference between wheelchair basketball and other disability sports. That, that's just my... Yeah. My... But then you could say that it's quite similar to like football in the UK, for example, um, in the sense of being like... In the UK, yeah. football is probably the number one sport, you would argue. And then... Yeah. Also, as well, what you, I mean, I know for a fact in Spain, because that's where I played my professional basketball the longest, um, there's a lot of funding goes into sports yeah. uh, from local regions. Um, it's very, very, or historically, it's been very easy for wheelchair basketball teams to get big sponsorship deals, which they use to pay players. Yeah. Um, in the UK, that just doesn't seem to happen with any disability sports, like at all. Um, and, and it's a shame. I, I, I personally think it's a it's a UK thing, um, more more so than than anything else. And do you think that's maybe because as you're saying that in my head, I think it's potentially different the fact that the perception is different in the sense of like when you look at wheelchair basketball, the the sort of athletic side of it and the nutritional side of it and performance side of it off the pitch is really emphasised when you see top athletes performing, but in terms of other sports in the UK, you kind of get this sort of cookie cutter, take part. It's not really a, it's all about inclusion type of thing rather than about the athletes. Yeah, so like, so, so, in, so in, in Spain, if you're like, or in Germany or in Italy or in Turkey or in France, like, if you're getting paid to play, you have to fucking perform. Mm-hmm. You have to turn up for training, you've got to be in shape, you have to, you know, you have to do all of these things. It's not a case of turning up and, oh, well, you know, it's the taking part that counts. If we lose, it doesn't matter. It fucking does matter because the fact is the more successful the teams are, the more money the team gets. Yeah. Which means the more money the team president gets, the, like, the, the better it is for everybody. So there's an element that you have that element of pressure. You have to perform. And if you don't perform, you get fucking told. Whereas in the UK, it's like, oh, come on, come and have a go. Uh, yeah. You know, matter. Um, and all that kind of stuff. It's just, it's just a complete other level in terms of professionalism, and it, and it's it's funny because talking about the, the the salary thing in the USA, domestic basketball. That that's why all the USA players come to Europe. In fact, if if there's a lot of players that play able body basketball, American that come to Europe because they make much more money than they would in the NBA. Oh really? That's- yeah. But in the NBA, you, 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 they, they, uh, I think they get a cap uh, or, the, you know, there's a, a lot of players, they, they, they earn, good, don't get me wrong, it's good money, yeah. but you can earn much more money in Europe, like much, much more. So, and domestic wheelchair basketball in America, there's no money in it at all, even though mm-hmm. basketball's a huge sport over there. It's just not seen the same. I think it's, it depends on, like in, in Europe, um, Spain, Germany, Italy and Turkey are like sort of generally being the powerhouses of wheelchair basketball in terms of the leagues being strong. France, they do pay players and they 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 do have professional teams, but not in the same sort of not in the same level. Not yeah. do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So would you say that the, the main issue and difference between Europe and sort of the rest of the world is is uh, prof- the professionalism of the sport and the the, the way they showcase it? Yeah, it's it's seen as a professional sport. It's like it gets it's showcased on TV. Um, uh, you know, look, it, like it's televised. It's you know, the, the, you, you have press coming to each game, interviewing players after the game. It's just like you would see a professional, yeah, professional sport. That, that the whole setup is exactly the same. Um, That's kind of why I wanted to talk about it because I was just thinking about how I've been involved in. Other loads of sports, my main one being wheelchair football, but mm-hmm. um, it would seem that there's like this idea of we don't we we, we showcase it in a very um, take part kind of way, and also there's no 
they're all it's all volunteers, it's all nobody gets paid, nothing's there's no money in it. And the problem with that is there's no long term sustainability with that. No, no. Um, so it was good to hear that from you talking about how it can be done. It can be done. So yeah. So, so, so in Europe, you, you have uh, like a hierarchy. It's like it's run, run as a business. So if you're team president, suddenly you have team manager, uh, team coordinator, uh, team physio, team coach, team assistant coach, team mechanic, um, team bus driver. You know, you, you have a, a back room of staff. Yeah. Do all the things behind the scenes. Then you have the players. Um, so it's... And, they, and everybody gets paid. Yeah. And I think... What because I think people don't realize that that's happening, happening in other parts of the world almost, and how we are we are very behind the curve with that 100%. Um, so, and, and the thing, because it's like that in the UK, as soon as UK players get to a certain level, they're like, Right, I want to piss off and start getting paid for what I do, and they mm-hmm. leave. So, the league in the UK never gets stronger, if anything, it's just got weaker and weaker. So that's quite interesting because you could you could see there's quite a similar comparison to you know uh, able-bodied with uh, and I look at the gap between for example Scotland Scottish football and English football the financial mm-hmm. you know a lot of our top players go over there uh, and you've seen that with like, like Andy Robertson and Kim Tierney and yep. like mm-hmm. so it's it's this kind of reoccurring theme of actually having to promote it and 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 show it in the same light yeah. Yeah, which obviously basketball is kind of ahead of, ahead of the curve with that. Mm-hmm. And so going back to what you were talking about when you were finishing up playing basketball, that so it was obviously a very tough decision. And a lot mm-hmm. of people, you know, a lot of people struggle to sort of fill that void, so to speak. And mm-hmm. you, you've ended up going right into focusing on nutrition and coaching and uh, being a really excellent personal trainer. So what was that kind of? transition for you like and, and where did that it, want to do that come from? there really wasn't a transition because it's something I've been doing for many years yeah. alongside professional basketball so it was just a case of I'm not playing basketball anymore so uh-huh. I have uh, well for one I have a lot more physical energy each day because I'm not training five or six hours a day um, I have a lot more mental energy uh, because obviously I'm not physically goosed all the time and, and, and then having to work on the side as well um, I, mean, I purposely started my my journey into the, the, the my starting my business, I started taking the first steps in 2013, about seven years ago, and um, because I knew the day would come when I stopped playing. Um, and it's just been a case of, right, okay, I don't play basketball, but yeah, I still have, I still make a, a good living doing what I'm doing. And it's not just about training. It's not just about um, nutrition. It's about changing the way people feel, changing the way people think, the thought processes. It's almost like, uh, some people call it life coaching. Um, I just I don't, I don't see it like that I just see it's like you, you can literally change your life what everything you do physically is dictated by what goes on up here so if you get up here sorted and you can change the way you think you can literally do anything you want and that's what I help people do it's something I'm really, really passionate about yeah I couldn't agree more because um, from my experience there's been things where I've done really well physically and but my mind has not been in a good place, and ultimately, yeah, yeah. ultimately that you end up going backwards. Um, of course. So I think that's a big part that's sort of missing out. But nutritionally, right now, nutrition is like a big part, especially because of the fact it's always a big part. But especially because of the fact that gyms are shut most places, and so in terms of staying healthy and living a healthy lifestyle, nutrition is more important than ever. It's. Do you know what, mate? It's just about controlling the controllables. So, you know, if you can't go to a gym, you can still get your ass outside, go for a walk or go for a push. You might not want to not be, a, you know, your first choice of things to do, but it's something that is available for you to do. Um, you can go and do some exercise outside. You can do some exercise at home. That is a choice. Um, you will always have a choice. So it's not just, yeah, and, and you, you know, people... You know, during the lockdown, you see people and people are drinking more, people are taking more drugs, people yeah. are eating more shit food. And I get it, I've been there and done done all three to mm. the extra and I'm I'm very open about that in my life. But it's a choice. So, you know, if you can control you might not be able to go to the gym, but you don't let that be an excuse to go and eat a load of shit all day, every day. 
if you want to eat a bit of junk, that's fine, but I'll have a little bit. You don't need to go OTT with it. It's a choice. You know, if you can control the things that you can control, then there's no excuse for you not to let anything slip. Yeah. You expect yourself, you know. And you mentioned there how there was a point where you were you were the other way around and you were kind of indulging in these things and not having that kind of focus, focusing on nutrition. A lot of people struggle with sort of flipping that mindset and, that, and, and going to where you are now with that level of discipline. What was the biggest kind of changing factor for you in, in changing that routine? Um, hmm, that's a very, very good question. I might need a moment to think about that. I mean... Ultimately, right, okay, so ult- ultimately, when, when people have shit that goes on in their lives or things go sideways, we all have some kind of crutch. People emotionally eat. So people have shit time, they go and fucking, you know, get balls deep in a big tub of Ben and Jerry's or something, you know, that's one thing. People gamble, people go and sleep around or people take drugs people drink excessively everybody has uh people change you know everybody has some kind of crutch that they use or historically have used at certain points when things go sideways um mine has always been drinking drugs since a very early age because of the life i led when i was very young um so what happens is you, you go through you go through stages and when things go sideways and you you fall back into old habits. The key is like, um, it's not about saying you're never ever going to drink again or never ever going to do X, Y, Z again. It's about, okay, I'm going to catch myself when this starts. You, you can see when it starts to come on. So let's say, for example, <clears throat> something really bad happens and you go on a, a month spree of just fucking boozing and doing whatever. You do a lot of work on yourself and, and you become more aware of yourself and your triggers and your behaviours and how you feel and how you act, dependent on what's going on. The idea is then, okay, if something goes sideways, it's not going to be a month next time. It might just be two weeks, then a week. Then it might just be you have a bad couple of days mentally. Then it might be, right, you're just going to you're gonna get smashed one night. And then it's about being, a, being that self-aware that you can pick yourself up on stuff. <clears throat> and that's the same with, it's not just about drink or drugs or it, it, you can use that for... Yeah, you know, when if people, I'll give you an example, if people go off track with the nutrition at the weekend, they go, oh, fuck it, I might as well just carry on. They, they binge for days. Yeah. Well, the key is it's, it's about not trying to be perfect and saying, right, we're not going to binge for days because it's too big of an ask if that's been a, if that's an habitual thing that you've done for many, many years. Yeah. The next step is instead of going into fuck it mode for a week, we cut it down to a couple of days and then to a day. And then really, you've not done that much damage. You can get yourself back on. And it's just about being like that. It's not trying to be perfect. It's about being realistic and understanding how you are and how you react to certain circumstances that life throws at you and how to deal with them when they do. You know, it's, that was really well put because I think a lot of people and a lot of trainers give up this idea that you're going to be 100% all the time perfect and there's going to be no problems. And the no. thing is, as well, with that, uh, you being aware of the fact of where to catch yourself and, and getting to know yourself better. So when did you start to realise things where you were like, oh, that's something that I need to, I need, I need to be able to catch myself on that? Well, it's... Right, OK. When, when I hit rock bottom... When I hit rock bottom, um, there was a lot of things going on in my life. Um, you know, my, I'm not going to go into the full, I mean, it's in the public domain. I've talked about it in videos before. Mm. I'm not going to do too much detail in this, but I'll give you the, the key points. Um, I was made bankrupt for half a million pounds. Um, I got dropped from the GB team because I had an injury and because uh, of the bankruptcy. They wouldn't, I couldn't get my surgery done. Um, that meant I couldn't play professionally in Germany. I went on a, I had a clause in the contract that put me on a, I think it was a 20% salary. Um, my house got raided twice by the police. Um, I was in a real bad way mentally. I didn't have a pot to piss in. And it was like, a, you know, I was having to borrow like a tenner off my wife to put 
fuel in the car. And I just thought, um, I'm, and with the with the bankruptcy, there was going to be an attachment on my earnings for the next 20 years. So no matter what I did with my life, I would have made minimum wage. So I just thought, that's me, done. And something clicked. Some I don't know what it was. Something just changed. And within, literally, mate, within days, my life changed like night and day, and it just fucking blew me away. And it was the, the way, the thing that changed was the way that I started to see the world. I was negative all the time. I was fucking, never took responsibility for my actions, never, never owned my actions, never owned my life. It was always somebody else's fault. It, you know, it was because this happened. I never looked in the mirror and actually, Dan, you're where you are right now because of the fucking stupid decisions that you've made. Yeah, yeah. And when I did that, and things just started to change really, really quickly. I, I, it's almost I, I remember my, my wife thought I was being like she she thought I was being weird because I just like completely changed like she thought what's going on here yeah. uh, and and because it changed because the change was so drastic it really I, I really started to delve into why I wanted to know why because I wanted more because mm-hmm. I, I it was the best I'd felt mentally for since for, for forever. Um, and things, good things were happening consistently in my life when it, I was always like penthouse or shit house. There was never like any consistency. I'd either be up here or right down here, uh, which was very, you know, that wasn't very you know, a nice place to be in. You know, it was nice when it was good, but it was like, I, th- th- there's been times in my life I've not wanted to be here, I mean, really. Yeah. And yeah. It's been a really, honestly, it's genuinely admirable what you've managed to deal with and, and I think it gives people in a time where you know like depression and suicides are at an all-time high um, yeah my my hometown St Helens it's got the highest suicide rate in in, in the country um it's and and you know to, to to think that I have been at that point more than once in my life a real fucking scary thought to think you know sometimes people don't understand they have so much to live for the you know when, when when you're when you're in that mindset it's like all you can see is this you can't see any wider you you know the world is the world everything around you is the same as it is to everybody else the only difference is how you see it Everything's the same for everybody. The only difference is how you see it. <clears throat> and as you do some work on yourself and you start doing things that can make you feel better, <clears throat> instead of seeing like that, you start to see a little bit wider and then a little bit wider and a little bit wider. And then you're like, fuck, the world looks like a completely different place. Actually, yeah, there's a lot of shit in the world, but there's also a lot of good. You know, if you, if you go looking for shit, you're going to find it. Sure. <laughs> as hell if you go looking for good you're also going to find that sure as hell it's just how you yeah, go about yeah. and, and and it's easy to sit here and say it but when you're fucking on the floor and you feel like you've got nothing to live for it's a hard thing to come out of but it's not a case of you know if let's say somebody's severely depressed if we if we put that on a sliding scale of how do you feel out of 10 that's a one for, to, for somebody then to go, right, come on, you know, you need to be positive and do that and, and try and make them feel like an eight or nine out of 10. It's completely unrealistic. And that's where so many people, in my opinion, go wrong. When they're feeling down, they, they try to lie to themselves and say, right, if I tell myself I'm, I'm positive, I'm going to be positive. It doesn't work like that. So what I always try and uh, teach is if you're at a one out of 10, Let's aim to get to a two or three. Because when you get to a two or three, you're going to be at, then be able to see how to get to a three or four. And then if you can get from a three or four to a five or six, jumping from one to five or six is a fucking significant jump and you're going to feel much, much better. You might not still feel 100% all the time, but you're going to feel a damn sight better than what you did at the start. And it's not a quick process. It's something that you you have to make a little bit of an effort with. And that effort might just be getting your ass out of bed and I'm getting some fresh air. If you know, if you yeah. people that are depressed stay in bed all day sleeping because they feel like they've got nothing to get up for, it, you know that thing of getting from a one to a two 
could be simple as simple as get out of bed, shower, get dressed, go for a walk. Or get out of get out of bed, get a shower. Something as simple as that. And it's a process. Definitely. Step by step. Does that um, make sense? Yeah, yeah, completely, completely makes sense. And I think it's something that means a lot for people right now because there are a lot, you know, a lot of us are stuck inside with our own thoughts. Yeah. And um, look, looking at someone as successful as you and what you've managed to achieve from that point, people can go, it's not impossible. It's not, it's all doable. Honestly, trust me, I, I, I say if, if fucking I can, if I can do it, anybody can do it seriously uh I, i'm i'm fucking the same as everybody else i've got a hole in my ass i sit down to have a shit i fucking you know i'm no different to anybody else i'm no i'm no worse i'm the same yeah if i do something then the next person can um there's all there's always a way there's always a way out there's always a way out um did you ever get um did you ever get therapy or go on antidepressants Never had antidepressants. <coughs> um, I when, when I started to change, um, I started to you know started to watch loads of documentaries, loads of podcasts on YouTube. I come across various people. Um, I started to make money again. And when I got who is good at changing the way you think, and then you know I've worked with some great, great, great coaches over the years, and I've been taught a hell of a lot, and it's all these things that have enabled me, they've, I've been given the tools from my mentors to the, yeah. then be able to put it in my own way and use my own story as a platform then to go and help others using set of tools. And, you know, the big bag of tools I have, it's not a case of give the whole bag to somebody. You know, certain tools are needed for various people at certain times. Some tools don't work for everybody. It's a case of, you know, getting to know somebody, getting to know what flicks their switch, what they need at specific times, and then okay, this is what we're going to do. Go away and do that. And you know, I guess spoke about a lot how important physical training is and exercise is to your mental health. You know, yeah. statistics show that it improves it, it improves depression by thirty percent, which is uh, and I, but I don't think many people talk about the benefits of nutrition on your mental health. Oh God, it's you know all these things. It's all part of the same fucking jigsaw. It's like if you're trying to bake a cake and, you know, let's say your nutrition's an ingredient, exercise an ingredient, um, having a, a good mindset, uh, you know, your mental health is another ingredient and all these things. If you're missing one of those, the cake's going to come out fucking looking like shit. It's not going to be the same. So you can't, it, they're all part of the set and they're all just as equally as important. Um, so with the nutrition, if your nutrition is... Um, comprise mostly of processed foods, which most people's are. Mm. What that and alcohol. What what that does is it causes inflammation in the body. Inflammation is the cause of pretty much all disease and stress. When you've got inflammation, your body you put your body into a stressful mode anyway. Your cortisol, your your, hot, your stress hormone level rises. Um, when you, you you have inflammation, you you have inflammation in your gut, which can then cause gut issues which make you feel lethargic um can affect your sleep affect your ability to absorb nutrients um just make you feel like a bag of shit basically um mm. and getting all the things that your body needs to function optimally so your energy is going to be shit you're not going to want to do nothing and that affects you mentally so when you start feeding your body what it actually does need lots of nutrient-dense stuff, what happens is your inflammation levels go down, you start to absorb all the nutrients, your energy levels stay constant, you start to sleep better, you feel mentally more acute, you feel lighter, you feel cleaner, you have much more energy. And when all these things are happening, life just seems easier. Yeah. Um, and So, yeah, it's fucking super, super, super important, nutrition, super important. It's like the stress doesn't go away, but you manage stress better. Anyway. Yeah, be, because yeah. place of you know, um, you know, when, when you're feeling lethargic and like a sloth and like a bag of shit, fucking getting up and cooking your food seems like such an effort that you go, you know, you're clicking on Deliveroo to get a takeaway. So any fucking life fucking circumstance that gets through at you that's a tough one, you, you're gonna crumble because you haven't got the you haven't got the 
the mental fortitude, the physical capability at that moment in time because you, you're just giving your body, you, you're hammering your body into the ground by just feeding it shit all the time. And it, yeah, it does have an effect on everything in your life. It's about getting comfortable with the uncomfortable, really. Yeah, you, you, yeah, it's, yeah, of course it is. Of course it is. You, you, I always say with, 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 with things, when, when you get through, through into life situations, I, I was always a person, if something went wrong, I'd be sticking my head in the sand and hoping it would go away. Like, if I can't see it, it's not the type of scenario. Um, now, you, you get a problem. It's like, okay, what can I do to deal with this fucking thing now and tackle it head on? And doing that, even if it's just a small thing, then you, actually I'm making an effort to fix this. And when you start taking them steps, the next steps unfold in front of you and you know what to do next and you know what to do next. And ultimately, you either fix the problem or you have closure on it and you can, that's it. And, you know, the more that you do these things and you take those steps, you build that kind of confidence and trust within yourself that you're, you're going to do this. What I said before, confidence comes with experience. Yeah. Um, so if you're not, not used to tackling problems head on, you're not going to be very confident that you're going to be able to fucking deal with it. But once you start and you fucking tackle your first problem head on and you think, actually, a lot of the time when something happens, it's never as bad as we always tell ourselves it is at the start. It never is. It doesn't mean that it's not bad. Yeah. But we, we paint a picture to ourselves at the start because we're projecting and we're telling stories that are not true, that's not happened. We always make it worse than what it actually is. And once you deal with your first problem, the next problem that comes around, doesn't mean that you're not going to think, fuck. But you then think, well, if I can deal with that, I can deal with this. And that you have then gain that confidence to then start tackling anything that life throws at you. I couldn't agree more, mate. I think that's a great note to finish on. Um, but what now that you've kind of done all this stuff and you're you're really in a good place in life, what are your have you got anything in your mind where you're like, I want to do this now, I want to go and push on and bring this further in this way? What are your goals going forward? Right, okay. So I I'm I'm gonna tell you this first. It's something that I've not gone public with yet, but I'm launching a new brand in the new year. It's called MTFU, and that stands for Man the Fuck Up. Now, it's going to cause some... Uh, it's going to cause a little bit of an uproar to certain people because people will think I'm saying people need to man the fuck up and when that's a big problem for a lot of males. I don't mean it like that. I'm, my My idea my my version of man the fuck up man the fuck up to me means taking responsibility taking ownership being true to yourself being true to your feelings being open about how you feel being a good father being a good husband or partner being a good friend all these things to me are what being a man is about and it's not about stop being a pussy and stop being soft. It's not about that. It's it man the fuck up means take control back over your life. Take your fucking power back because when you're not doing those things, you're giving your power away. Um, and so it's going to be a brand and it's going to have a real focus on male mental health. There's going to be a lot of support for men. Um, I'm looking to set up a foundation with it. Um, there's a lot of products that are going to be coming out like a journal. So with specific prompts on certain days for you to get stuff out of your head on onto paper. And there's going to be a whole host of things. There's going to be a big support network where I'm going to be having experts in various areas of life. And it's going to be a place where men can come and say what they want without fear of being fucking judged like they would if they were to open up maybe to the partners or to the family or to the friends. Um, so that's, I'm really, really, really excited about that. Um, so that's why I planned in the new year. I have big, big plans for my own business, the high court method, um, just to keep, you know, changing people's lives one person at a time. Um, and obviously I, I'm still on my own journey. My own journey is never going to stop. You know, as I go through my own journey, I go deeper into myself and things keep popping up that I have to deal with that I've got locked inside and, you know, when I do, it's tough, but, you know, we, you know, once, once it's dealt with, it's dealt with and it's done and then I can push forward and keep pushing forward. So 
it's um it's it's never it's never a it's never like an it's never like um just all sunshine and rainbows it's a, it's a it's a bumpy fucking road that we travel um but it's very if we can travel it and we can endure it it's a very very re- rewarding journey i love what you said that because it's a lot of people wait to look at you and think that they're you're everything's going to be fine for him now but like you say it's a continuing process of dealing with these things no never the case mate do, do you know what <coughs> i know <coughs> excuse me i know some extremely successful people multi multi-millionaires they have the same shit that goes on day in day out that they have to deal with and it's no you know when it's an emotional stuff that you have to deal with it doesn't matter how much fucking money you have in the bank it's still just as difficult there's certain problems that arise that if you throw money at yeah they can it can go away quicker but when it's when it's stuff that's to do with you it doesn't matter what point in journey in, in the journey you are, it's just as hard as it is for anybody else. So I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. And you know, with what you were talking about with your New Year plans with uh, yep. yeah, what I really like about it is the fact that you're changing the perception of what it means to be a man, and and how it, it's not all about it's not about being tough. It's about being open and honest about how you're feeling for me that's that strength like uh, like f- fucking hell I, I, there's been times I've done videos and broke down like not intentionally I've not done it for effect because you can't fake that shit yeah. but you putting yourself out there I'm opening yourself up and being fucking vulnerable in order so that you could maybe get through to some people and help them but you're actually putting yourself in a, in a place where you can be attacked and I'm willing to do that um, and it, it, yeah, it's it's um, it, 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 it's a funny one because men men think they've got to put on this fucking bravado, but for me, owning up and and showing up as yourself, not having to play up to anybody's ideals or playing down to anybody ideal anybody's ideals, and being comfortable in who you are as a person and what you like and what you don't like in life, that's strength in my eyes. Couldn't agree more again, and, and you're saving lives. It will save loads of lives. I'm looking forward to seeing it. But this has been an absolute pleasure, Dan. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed it as well, mate. And uh, sorry for being a massive pain in the ass because I know I'm like uh, the Scarlet Pimpernel when you <laughs> to, to get hold of. So, um, it's not, but you're definitely worth the wait. And uh, where can everyone find you on social media? Um, Twitter and Instagram at Dan Highcock Five. Uh, in uh, Facebook, my personal profile and my athlete page is Dan Highcock. Uh, LinkedIn, uh, Dan Highcock, and that's basically it. Um, if you would do me the pleasure of sending me this over, and I will share it everywhere for you because I, I would love to put this out myself because I've really enjoyed it. I think there's some really, really good, good teaching points that might help people. This has definitely been one of my favourites, and it's a. Uh... I really appreciate it. So um, I can say that, at least, and I'm sure a lot of people listen to well as well. So thank you. Thank you. No, it's been a pleasure, mate. A reminder, this podcast is sponsored by Kale Financial. who are currently offering free wills to everyone, even if you're not a client. Don't be in the 60% of adults that are well. Call Kale Financial on 0141 447 0290 or email advice at kalefinancial.co.uk for more information. I hope you all enjoyed that episode. I really did, and it was great talking to Dan. Next week, we'll be doing something a little bit different. When I started the All About Valley podcast, I started it with an episode of me just talking about my own journey and things I've been through. And at the time... There was another part of that story that I really struggled to share. A lot of people came came to me with, you know, great feedback saying how much it helped them, hearing me open up on certain things. And with what's going on in the world right now and you know, suicide rates and depression rates higher than ever, I felt the need to hopefully, you know, express myself again and share the sto- share some stories about how I was able to overcome what I have and you know, hopefully it can help somebody out there. I think this is the time now more than ever that we all need to really buy to rally together and express ourselves honestly and openly and help as many people as we can. And that's what I'll be trying to do next week. So 
it will be difficult for me and it's going to be quite emotional and I'm, 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 in some ways I'm, I'm a little bit scared to talk about the things I will be talking about. But if you could all give it a listen and tune in and support me with it, I would be greatly appreciated and hopefully, like I've always said, it can help just the one person out there and it would be job accomplished for me. Thank you. Thank you, Felton.